I think I'm recording. I've been recording only part of the screen in the past, but I guess I can record the whole screen. Look, I learned something new tonight. All right. Um, let's start with this. Actually, Sneha, you had asked about electrons jumping energy levels. Yeah. And I started looking up more of that stuff because, yes, in years past, we used the Rydberg equation and we did um, – some of the different, like the series, the passion series, and the, I can't remember them all. But as much as I can find, I don't think they're going to do a lot of that on the on the exam. And so I'm not, I feel like if we, we could review it, but it wouldn't be tested. Okay, then that's fine. Okay, so I mean, talking about electrons is, are important, but a lot of it has to do with, um, I mean, when I look at stuff, the electrons are like... Um, the electron configuration or um, Coulomb's law. And so, um, and I want to say Coulomb's law to talk to you about the whole class because that just keeps coming up. I want to make sure that everyone's familiar with it. So I thought what we do is we could jump into um, gases and kind of review that a little bit. And we could do that for like a half an hour or so. And then we could do electrochem for a half an hour or less actually at this point. And then we'd be finished. All right. Okay. So... Um, let's start as far as gases. I think what I'd like to do is, um, take a look at, where did I put it? There's a reference sheet. Ah, here we go. Okay. Let me share that with you guys. All right. <clears throat> Can you guys see the gases in here now? Or the reference? Okay. Yeah? Okay. Something that's important for the gases is that, or it's important for all the subjects, but the if, if, there, if it involves a calculation with an equation, it has to be here in the reference sheet because they really don't want you to have to memorize those equations. So something, you know, I felt like doing the molar mass with diffusion and effusion was important. And I, and I think it's something you'll come across in college chemistry, but it's not going to be tested. So it's not going to appear on my final exam. Um, you should know that um, the lighter a substance is, the faster it effuses or diffuses, but you won't have to do the calculation. You can see the ideal gas law here. You can see um, when you're doing mole fractions um, that you know the mole fraction times the total pressure gives you the partial pressure. You have Dalton's law of partial pressures, and we use that a lot. And they will use this one a lot, especially when you collect something over water. We did that, if you guys remember, we did that with the butane lighters in general chemistry. And I think we did it with the... Um, the magnesium ribbons and hydrochloric acid, and we collected the the hydrogen gas um, in in that that was one experiment. Um, and then the last one here is that moles are equal to the mass over the molar mass. This is mass. This is molar mass. And this is one of those things where they would substitute this in in the PV equals nRT, and they'll do that with density. And so I'm going to show you one of those problems tonight. Um, if we go back to, um, I like to look at the retakes uh, because those are ones that you guys don't ever get to review usually. You know, you can come in and talk to me, but I, I don't usually talk about it afterwards. So what I thought I would do is go back to the retake on gases and go through it and it would kind of give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions that I thought would be a good way to review. And then also um, talk about a couple of those free response, other styles of free response. Um, so gases, um, we talked about the, we talked about the formulas. Oh, we didn't talk about, oh, this is interesting actually. You probably didn't notice, but the combined gas law was not on the equation sheet but it's still, it's important enough that you have to have it memorized. And I don't know how they justify that one, but you have to use the combined gas law. So that's, and there's a couple different ways to do it. The P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. 
And actually, why don't I write this out on the on the um, here we go uh, on the bamboo paper here. Okay, so so P one V one over T one. Wow, I'm not sticking to the lines very well, am I? P2, V2 over T2. And then if you do a little cross multiplication, sometimes it's easier, or many students have found if they do P1, V1, T2 is equal to P2, V2, T1. And so this is kind of the one that I think a lot of students prefer. And I can understand that because the manipulation at that point, sometimes the memorization is a little bit harder, but that's a good yeah, one to have. I, Say again. I remember that one from physics, so. Oh, really? Awesome. That is awesome. Okay. And we're going to, and I'm going to show you a problem today with that one too. Okay. So let's go back to the retake oh, test. Mr. Warner? Yes. I noticed I didn't put the um, relationship between K of C and K of P in the section. So are we going to need to know that? I'm going to assume not. Like, okay. I, I think it's important that you, that you know about it for college, but I, if it's not on the sheet, they're not going to, they're not going to test you on it in, unless they provide the equation in the, in the problem itself. Okay. Um, so it's just, I, I don't altogether get where they're headed with some of the stuff, but it is what it is. Okay. So can you guys see the, um, the retake test now? Yeah. Okay. So uh, which describes a change, which describes, well, changes, should just say changes, huh? that occur, oh, how about this? I guess I should read the whole thing. A change that occurs when a sample of nitrogen is sealed in a metal tank, then heated from 250 to 300 Kelvin. Now, you should know that all of the gases, um, whenever you're dealing with temperature, it has to be in the absolute temperature scale. It has to be in Kelvins. So... Um, if you, and this is, and this question really goes to the questions about, um, you know, the, the properties of gases and the kinetic molecular theory. And so a regular gas, a regular gas or a normal gas versus an ideal gas. And so, um, a real gas, I guess is what I should call it a real gas versus an ideal gas. So in this particular instance, it's kind of an ideal gas, but it doesn't really matter. They're going to behave the same. If you increase the temperature, they're going to have more kinetic energy. They're going to have more, um, they're going to end up having more velocity, right? Kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. And so the mass stays the same. It's still nitrogen. So the V had to increase. And temperature, if you remember, is the average kinetic energy. Temperature is average kinetic energy. You increase the temperature, you increase the average kinetic energy with mass being the same They had to increase velocity. If now they're moving faster, they're hitting the container with more force, okay? And so the area, um, pressure equals force over area, the area is the same. So the force, uh, and the force went up because they're, they're hitting the side with more force, so the pressure increases. So that's why it's C. So hopefully you guys followed that or knew it even before I began speaking. Um, what is the resulting pressure when the quantities of gases listed below are mixed and placed in a 12 liter vessel at constant temperature? So in this particular instance, you are, um, you're really, you're going from, you're doing a, a combined gas law. And so let's, let's show this one because it's, this is a popular style of question. Okay, so can you guys all see the, um, oh, dang nabbit, it messed me up again. Let's try this again. Can you guys see the bamboo paper now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we had in that situation is that we had, um, oops, we had, uh, 4.0 liters of neon at 
2.0 atmospheres. We had 2.0 liters of helium at 3.0 atmospheres and 2.0 liters of argon at 5.0 atmospheres. Does it matter the identity of any of these gases? No. No. The answer is no. Because most of the time, you guys will never have to do a conversion, any sort of, a, well, not conversion, but you won't have to relate. Um, there's a way of relating ideal gases to real gases. Like if it's a real gas, there is a, um, gosh, and the name of the formula is escaping me, but there's a, a way to calculate if it's a real gas, what is going to happen. You guys don't have to do that. So you can always assume that they're ideal gases, in which case, and these are, these are the noble gases, and monatomic gases and small diatomic gases behave like ideal gases. So the identity, like who cares? Whatever, it's fine. So what we have to do is all of this is going to go into 12 point liter. It's going to go in that volume, right? And it's a constant temperature. And that kind of is your giveaway that you're going to have to use the combined gas law. So you're going to have P1, V1 equals P2, V2. So for the first one, you have 2.0 atmospheres times 4.0 liters is equal to, and they want to know, because you're overall, they want to know the pressure. So what's the pressure for the new one, which is P2 times the volume of the two, which was 12.0 liters. So for this one, P2 is equal to 8 over 12. And I should probably have my calculator out. I and mean, we know what the answer is, but it would be good to just... Okay. Um, so if I was going to make this into decimals, I, of course, I'm having to do it. You guys probably already do it without. And that's equal to 0 point, let's say, 6, 7 atmospheres. Oh, you guys don't have a calculator. Ha! Huh. Because these are multiple choice. What a jerk am I. <laughs> Let's just leave it as 8 twelfths because in this situation, in this situation, um, it's going to remain, you're, you're going to have all of them are going to be over 12. Okay. So that's the first one. The second one is 6 over 12, right? I mean, we're going to be the same formula each time. So 6 over 12. And the last one is 10 over 12, right? And if we add these three together, which is basically Dalton's law, so P total, P total is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3. So our P total is equal to, I know that's not very legible, I apologize. So 8 twelfths plus 6 twelfths plus 10 twelfths and that's 14, and that's 24, that's 24 twelfths, which is the P total is equal to two atmospheres. So did you guys follow that? Yeah. That is a popular question with AP. They love taking it and saying you have all these different, basically um, these three different gases and then you're going to open open a valve and they're all going to come together the way that they're drawing pictures now the way that it would appear in a picture is to do this they would say here's one glass vault with a volume of four and here's uh another that's half that volume right and here's another one that's half that volume, okay? And they're connected by, and there's a valve on each one. My drawing is awful. I wish I had a better drawing. Okay, and then let's say they evacuated all of these into, uh, that one was entire, well, the, it's always my fault. I shouldn't say it was the, uh, the drawing's fault. I hit the button. Okay, so it, it's going to come down into a vessel that's 12, so now, oh, <laughs> jeez Louise, oh, no wonder these 
Review sessions go so long. <laughs> Gotta love technology. Yes. Okay, so we'll just do this. Hey, look, and there's a huge vessel here. <laughs> And so basically the picture would be like, hey, there's these three and they're all going into a large vessel. Well, what's the change? Or sometimes they would have it and just these are the three and then the valves are opened. And so now that the three can intermix, what would it be or something like that? But we're going to assume that it's all going into this larger vessel. And um, so that's where you're using the combined gas law. And, and that one, I have to be honest with you, that one gets me, but I know it gets students because that once we start talking about it, they're like, oh, that totally makes sense. All I have to do is just a combined gas law. And I think, you know, this is this trips a lot of people up. So when you see things, when, when you're changing the volume like that, you're changing the volume, you're using the combined gas law. That's not the ideal gas law. It's not diffusion or effusion. It's not speed or anything like that. This is this is the combined gas law. Okay. All right, um, now for number, oh, I need to show you. So now let's go back to the test. I better pick it up actually, huh? So like number three, where it says, which of the following gases effuses at half the rate of neon? Um, you, may, you just need to know that neon if uses faster because it's a smaller one because its mass is smaller. And so you just need to find a mass that was double, double of neon. Okay. But you're not going to have to do that calculation, but conceptually you should be able to recognize that. Okay. So we don't need to know that formula at all. Nope. Okay. Um, let's see. Consider a sample of gas confined at constant temperature and volume the closed system above. If more of this same gas is added at constant temperature, what effect is observed on pressure and average molecular velocity? So, um, so constant temperature, kinetic energy stays the same, velocity stays the same. If you add more gas, Dalton's law, you're going to increase pressure, which is why C is the correct answer. Um, five. At certain conditions, the molar volume of a real gas may be less than the value predicted by the ideal gas, which property accounts for this deviation. This is great. This pops up a lot. Forces of attraction exist between gas molecules. It's one of the ones, like there, of the five postulates of the kinetic molecular theory, that one pops up the most frequently of why is it not real? Um, why, is, why is the ideal gas law not applied to real gases? And it's mainly because there are forces of attraction. Okay, if you, if you decrease the temperature enough, that will, you'll, your volume will decrease more. And actually, I have a question that I want to show you guys. Let me pull it up real quick. Could we go over the kinetic molecular theory real quick? Sure. Um, give me just one second. Okay. Uh, I am going to I'll just do that one on the, uh, okay. So KMT, connect my theory. And really there's five postulates. So the first one is that uh, temperature, like the, um, well, kinetic energy related to temperature which is funny since the definition of temperature is the average kinetic energy. But you, you get that, right? And kinetic energy equals one half mv squared, okay? And so the mass, a lot of times, the mass is the same. The mass, it's, it's one gas. You heat it up at a gas, so if you increase kinetic energy, you must, the velocity must increase, okay? So that's number one. Number two, and, and these are not like, number one is not always this, like it, it can be shifted around depending upon, I guess, where you read. Um, gases consist of particles whose volume is negligible. So volume is negligible. Negligible, okay? And remember, this is for, ideal gases. 
the kinetic molecular theory is for ideal gases. Okay, so volume is negligible. Um, you assume that they occupy zero volume. And really, that one's kind of true too because gas particles are so small compared to the overall volume of the container when you calculate the volume of a gas, you don't take into consideration the volume of the actual particles. So volume, I guess I should write that, of particles. Okay. Volume of particles is negligible. Okay. Three, um, the particles are in continuous rapid random motion. Pretty straightforward. Um, number four, elastic collisions. This is saying no energy is lost in collisions. Okay, and this one is this one is not true for real. Which it's just it doesn't make sense in the real world. Elastic collisions don't, you know, energy is always transferred, you know, really that, that um, always energy is always lost, okay? And then number five, which is the one we were just talking about, is that there's no attraction between gas small particles. And this one is also not true for real. Okay, so four and five are the ones that are not true, but number five is the one that comes up a lot. If it's free response or multiple choice, like why is it that, you know, what are we not taking into account? Like the, the actual volume. And you know what, it says no attraction, but there's also something else to be said for repulsion. There's also some repulsion. So they're assuming there's no attraction. I should write that up here. No attraction, no repulsion. Repulsion. So, um, which, which of course we know to be not true. But um, let me show you a quick question from a, one of the AP Chem Solutions one that kind of, because AP Chem Solutions, they try to, to frame their questions such that it, it reflects AP as well. So um, at very low temperatures, the actual partial pressure of, um, what is this, Pro, propene is less than the value predicted using the ideal gas law. Explain why this is so. And you would say, oh, at low temperatures, they get closer together. And then there are forces of attraction. So when they're closer to again, closer to each other, and this is similar to if you want to look at it from, um, you know, a solid to liquid to gas. Like the reason that liquids they take up less volume is because now they're close together and they stick together. And so if you if you lower the temperature of a real gas, you're going to have attraction. It's going to start sticking together, and the volume is going to get a lot less. The KMT, the kinetic molecular theory for ideal gases, pretends as if like the whole liquid gas, um, liquid solid thing just doesn't exist. Like you can take gases all the way to absolute zero and you can take them all the way up really high and there's going to be no forces of attraction. But this is a big one. We know that there is and that's, that's what you would have to talk about. Okay, uh, let's go back to the test again. Um, oh, density. So I did want to talk about this. An organic compound has a density of 1.43 grams per liter at STP. What is the most likely molecular formula for or of this compound? So to show this one on the bamboo. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, we have a gas that the density, oh, <laughs> Let's try that again. All right. Density is equal to 1.43 grams per liter at STP. And now these were the, this, this is where the manipulations come in of the ideal gas law. We know that PV equals NRT. Well, when we're doing density, and as soon as grams are introduced, you're going to have to do some manipulations with moles. We know that moles are equal to mass over molar mass. I want to make it really big. So PV is equal to mass over molar mass RT. And this question is looking for the molecular formula, which is basically the molar mass. So MM and PV are going to switch spots. So molar mass is equal to mass over P, V, and then R, T. Now density, density is equal to mass over volume, which we have right here. So now we can say that molar mass is equal to, and in this case it's 1.43 replaces all of that, 1.43 grams per liter and this is at standard conditions, so STP, standard pressure, which is 1.0 atmospheres, and um, R, 0 0.0821 liters atmosphere, liters atmosphere over mole Kelvin, and then temperature, which at uh, 0 degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So what ends up happening is our Kelvin cancel, our atmospheres cancel, our liters cancel, leaving you with grams over moles. And uh, that's kind of a brutal one to have you guys solve for, but let's see. 273 times, like it's almost one and a half. So that's another, um, what is that, 14? 140, so is that um, one and a half, well, it's less than that, so 373, kind of like 410, 410 times 0 0.0821, which, oh, uh, 1,200. What are the answer choices? Uh, well, that's a good way to go, too. Let's go back over here. Take too much time trying to do this. So our answer oh, choices. Do you have to memorize R? Yes, you do have to memorize. Oh wait, do you have to memorize R? That's a good question. That one might be on the. Because I know there's a couple different ones. There are. Um, you do not have to memorize R. Okay. It's up there. So the point zero eight. They they say point zero eight two zero six liters atmosphere mole Kelvin. But you have to know which one to use. And if this involves gases, it involves the 0 0.0821. If it involves energy, it's going to be like, or like the thermo or something like that, then you're going to do 8.314. Okay, so are you guys looking at the retake test with me? Yeah. Okay, so here we have, oh, this is interesting, a carbon. So there's three carbons. This one's one carbon one carbon, here's three carbons and four carbons, and we have, um, so, and what, just looking back, I don't know if you guys probably, let me see if I can pull that up. So, I had something like a four. It was like 8% of 410, right? I think that's right, yeah. So, 10%, less something less than 10. I'm totally blanking on this. So less, it would be under 41. Under 41. Well, that's pretty good. So carbon and oxygen together, that's 12 and 16. 
So that's 28, so almost 30 there. And the other one's carbon times four, that's 28, I'm sorry, 48, haha. <laughs> and 36, and that one's gonna be over. So really it just came down to A or C, and the giveaway there was that each had one carbon, so kind of. Yeah, C is way too small, so I'd, yeah. I'd guess A. Yeah. I think A makes sense. And man, that, that's the hard part when they make you start doing a lot of that um, math in your head. But but yeah, that's good. It's good that we did that. Okay. Um, let's try to hit a couple more real quick. Eight, we've already talked about seven. Oh, this is the over water. So vapor pressure of water is 80 degrees Celsius at 355 millimeters of mercury. Which expression, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Which expression gives the fraction of water molecules in a sample? of nitrogen gas saturated with water vapor at 80 degrees Celsius and 740 millimeters of mercury total pressure. Oh, this is um, same temperature. Oh, this is um, Dalton's law. Water plus nitrogen. So water at 355 plus nitrogen gives you the 740. Right? So it's 355 over 740 because it's that fraction. And that because the, the, the partial pressure fraction is equal to the molar, um, sorry, the mole fraction. They're the same thing. Um, okay, so number nine is... Uh, we can skip number nine. Number 10. This is a stoichiometry problem. So, and it's at STP, which makes it kind of easy because that's like a, that has to do with um, the one mole of any gas at STP is equal to 22.4 liters. And here, if you have 44.8 liters at STP, that means there must be two moles of oxygen gas. So you just have to convert the 22.4 grams of methanol to moles. And you know that based upon this, it's a ratio of, um, you would take the two moles, do the ratio of three over two, and you can find out the number of moles and that would, where it was supposed to be. So that one's pretty straightforward. Oh, and number 11, how funny is that? Just converting moles to molecules. Okay, right here though, this is good. Um, this would pop up a lot, that you are collecting gas over water, and this was similar to our lab. And so, um, oops, moving around a lot. The partial pressure of the hydrogen gas. So first you have Dalton's Law, and you just take 751, the total pressure, minus the partial pressure of water. And that's that, that was that essential skill that was killing everybody in general chemistry. And so hopefully that won't get away from you. But when you're, when you're collecting over water, you just take the total minus the vapor pressure of water, and that gives you the partial pressure of your unknown gas, or in this case, the hydrogen gas. Now, to take that a step further, in B, how many moles of hydrogen gas have been collected? Well, you use, it's, it's a static situation now. There's no changing. It's been collected. It's in the tube. You know the partial pressure or the pressure of the gas. How many moles is it? So now you're going to use the ideal gas law. You have a temperature of the air. You have the volume you've collected because here's the volume collected at this temperature. And so you can plug those in and get the number of moles. Calculate the number of grams of hydrogen glass. Okay, and this is, this is that same manipulation where you get moles equals mass over molar mass, but this time you're solving for grams or see molar mass equals grams over moles. So you just do moles times molar mass. Um, am I going too fast through this? No, this is good, not good. Okay. And so you can see that, you know, they, they've included almost all of the gas laws here. Um, you know, they didn't do the, the combined gas law here, but you can see they just keep plugging in in all different ways and having you manipulate the equation. So understanding the gas laws is actually pretty easy, 
but then the application of it and knowing when to do it is the hard part. And that's, that's what trips um, students up. Um, and then here we go to mole fraction. And there are, you could have solved this. This is not the only way to solve the mole fraction. Um, you could have solved it a couple different ways. Um, if you had the mole fraction of the, if you had the mole fraction of the hydrogen gas, or you had the amount of moles, I guess. So I'm um, let me back up a second. You have the moles of the hydrogen gas here, okay? And um, you want to know what the total is. So, and you got this from this partial pressure. You could have also taken the 751 millimeters of mercury, and you could find the number of moles there. The really, if you guys were really on it and understanding, remembering that mole fraction and that partial pressure fraction is the same thing. And so you could say, oh, well, if 26.74 millimeters of mercury um, is the water and this is the total, then 26.74 divided by 751 gives me the mole fraction of water. And so um, I don't think I put it in there, but if I if I plug that in really quick, 20, let me just, sorry, let me scroll up again. 26.74 divided by 751. And I get 0 0.0356, which is the same thing here. So you didn't have to go through all this rigmarole. It makes it kind of easy. And do the, and you could do the same thing again for hydrogen. You know, take that, the, the partial pressure of hydrogen divided by the total pressure. So there was a shortcut way on that one. Um, e, you will not have on the test. So that makes that easy. Um, F, which gas deviates more from ideal gas behavior? H2O because of its greater mass and its polar molecule. And mainly that it's a polar molecule. Sometimes you can have more mass, like you have hydrogen H2, that's really small. And you might say, well, neon is larger than H2. And while it is, it's also monatomic. And so it's an, a noble gas. And so it actually would probably be less because it doesn't really matter. The main thing is you have to recognize is that if it's polar, if it's a polar molecule, you're gonna have greater deviation because, because of attraction. And if you guys remember the attraction postulate from the kinetic molecular theory is the one that comes up most frequently when talking about the deviations from um, ideal to real gases. Okay, and G, let's not worry about G right now. So let me, this is taking a bit longer than I thought it was going to. Um, I want to, maybe I talked about this stuff. You know what, we might be okay. Actually, the other things I want to talk to you guys about, we already talked about because of the test. So, um, let's go ahead and move past gases now, if you guys are okay with that. And let's go to electrochem. Oh, if it's okay. Well, Caitlin, I, I want to do some electrochem because I think it's important. I think that we did, we took the retake and I haven't graded it yet, but the, not to give it away, Sneha, but the, um, I don't know if you did the retake, but the, the multiple choice grades did not look good. So I am a little bit worried about that. So I think that doing electrochem now, just even if we'd spend it for like 15 minutes, I think will be helpful. Um, so but what I want to do is I want to try the YouTube app. Um, I, have, I have two different videos to show that aren't very long. So I'm going to, let's see, let me pull it up. Okay. Let's just say embedding on this video. What? Oh. Oh, for the love of Pete. Wouldn't you know? They have blocked the ability to embed and so you can't use it in that app. That is bizarre. Well, that's a good thing to know. Well, let's, uh, let me just switch to my desktop then. 
So it's uh, that particular video they don't allow you? Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, whoever the author is, they decided not to allow that one to be embedded on anybody else's video or whatever. Or, I'm sorry, web page. So. Okay, so I'm going to make this one big. When a strip of zinc metal is immersed in an aqueous copper 2 sulfate solution, electrons are transferred from zinc to the copper 2 ions. Copper metal deposits on the zinc strip and collects at the bottom of the flask. Zinc atoms are oxidized to zinc 2 ions, which enter the solution. This spontaneous oxidation reduction reaction is summarized in the chemical equation shown. Okay, so what they're saying there is that just not even hooked up to a, a galvanic cell, this happens. If you put the zinc in a copper sulfate solution, the copper wants to replace the zinc and so it comes out of solution and starts plating on the zinc. Like that just happens. So electrochem doesn't always require a battery or a voltage cell or something like that. Okay. Let's keep going. The spontaneous copper zinc oxidation reduction reaction can be made to yield useful electrical work by incorporating it in a voltaic cell. The zinc electrode is immersed in a solution of zinc sulfate. The copper electrode is immersed in a solution of copper 2 sulfate. No current flows through the light bulb because the electrical circuit is not complete. To complete the electrical circuit, we add a tubular bridge filled with aqueous sodium sulfate solution with a porous plug on each end. Okay, so this is the part where with galvanic cells, I just want to remind you a couple things. You have to have a salt bridge because it has to finish the circuit and it provides the ions. A, a mistake that students make is saying that electrons have to be transferred, but that is not the case. It is the ions that have to be um, that have to move and they complete that circuit. We now have a complete circuit and current flows. When we replace the light bulb with a voltmeter, we find that the cell has a potential or voltage of 1.1 volts. The copper electrode is the positive electrode and the zinc electrode is the Okay. The whole positive and negative labeling of electrodes, you do not have to know. You don't even have to worry about. So whenever they start talking about it, ignore it. But then how do you do the problem without knowing which one's positive and negative? You don't, you know because you know that the electrons move to the cathode because that's where reduction, they gain electrons. Okay. And you but know, they, say again? They don't require you to know that, but... I don't really understand how you do the problem without knowing that. Well, just the 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 labeling, like you on the galvanic cell, the positives over here, but on an electrolytic cell, the signs are reversed. Okay. So it gets weird, and it's you're right in some regards. Like if you know it, you know it. What's the big deal? But at the same time, they're just they're not going to ask questions about it. So you and you don't have to remember that then. As long as you just remember that the cathode is, and the way that a lot of people said it is because it's it's there's a T in it with the guy. It's got a the T is like a plus in cathode, so it moves to the cathode. But anyways, the cathode is where reduction. They both start with a vowel. Or they both start with a consonant. So reduction occurs there. Reduction is gain in electrons. So the electrons are moving towards the cathode. If you remember that, and then. Um, that's where plating is occurring because metals are coming out of solution and being plated there. And that the anode is where oxidation occurs. They both start with a vowel. Oxidation is losing electrons, so electrons are leaving the zinc in this case. They're losing, they're leaving the anode and moving across. So then metal, metal atoms are becoming ions and coming off into solution. And so the anode is losing mass. It's decreasing in mass because those metal ions are coming off. Okay, keep going. Negative electrode. As the cell reaction proceeds, zinc atoms of the zinc electrode lose electrons and move into the solution as zinc ions. At the same time, copper two ions acquire electrons at the copper electrode and form copper metal. The reaction in the left-hand compartment is oxidation of zinc. The electrode at which oxidation occurs is called the anode. 
The reaction in the right-hand compartment is reduction of copper. The electrode at which reduction occurs is called the cathode. Electrons flow from the anode to the cathode through the external circuit. To maintain electrical neutrality in the two cell compartments, ions must move through the salt bridge. In summary, remember that in a voltaic cell, the anode at which oxidation occurs is the negative electrode. The cathode at which reduction occurs is the positive electrode. Electrons flow through the external circuit from anode to cathode. Okay. So, um, so that's the, like, trying to, just trying to go back over that and make sure that we understand that. The next piece of this would be, let's do, um, is, um, and can sometimes be confusing, is, um, the calculations involving the E naught of the cell. So E naught of the cell is equal to, and, and there's two different ways to write this. This is the way it is. So the E naught reduction at the cathode minus E naught reduction at the anode. And so um, what they're going to do on the AP exam is they're going to provide you, like we used to be given, the students were given a list of all the reduction potentials, like I've been giving you on the test. And so Caitlin, you haven't seen that yet. But um, I provide you a huge list of all the reductions to reference. On the actual AP exam, if there's anything that, that, that corresponds to it, they're going to give those, in the question, they're going to give you the reduction potentials. And so um, when you're given these, uh, you then just have to, you actually usually end up, up adding them up. And so for a galvanic cell, for a galvanic cell, it's almost always positive. Here, wait, isn't it supposed to be E naught oxidation at the anode? So if you do it that way, you would do you could do the reduction at the cathode plus the E of oxidation at the anode. You could do either one. Okay. Because if you pulled the value straight off the table, you could just pull it straight off and plug it in here. Um, and usually it's a negative value, so it's reduction minus a negative makes it positive. If you do the oxidation, so then you take that value or you take that reaction and you reverse it because now it's oxidation, you then flip the sign. And so that's why these two equations are the same thing. They're going to give you the same answer. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Um, so... Um, what am I trying to say? Okay, so this is that's that's some of the basics of of electrochem. Now I would say this, Caitlin. Do you um did you go back and look at oxidation numbers? Like, how are you on your yeah. oxidation numbers? Yeah, I think I'm okay. Okay, good. Um, that's a small piece, but it's like a, a point here, a point there. It's like an easy way to lose or easy way to lose points if you don't remember it. So it's good to to review that. So um, on the test. You know they're gonna they're gonna set up a galvanic cell and they're gonna ask you a bunch of questions about that galvanic cell, and um, some of those questions will be um, finding the E naught of the cell. And actually, did I open up a question? I am sorry. I, I know I have one. Let me pull. I know I opened one. I'm going to pull up one really quick. Um, so apparently I didn't do it even though I was looking at them. I'm going to do a free response question.
Okay. Uh. Okay. So they would they would give you some things. Now this one, the way that this question is set up is it, not exactly what you would have to do, but understanding that you're going to have you're going to have a, a cathode and anode, and you're going to have some electrodes, and you're going to have to have a salt bridge. And so a common question would be like, what's the purpose of the salt bridge? And that would be to complete the ions. And what happens if you replace the salt bridge with a metal wire? And what happens to the voltage? And your answer would be the voltage goes to zero because, the, because there's no connection. You can't pass the ions. The purpose of the salt bridge is to pass ions to complete the circuit with no salt bridge, no, no passing of ions, so, this, so it, it stops. Another question would be, um, what happens to the mass at the electrodes? And we've already talked about the anode. It decreases mass because it's losing electrons. That oxidation at the anode loses electrons, so that means the mass goes down. Reduction, it's gaining electrons, so, so ions are coming out of solution and plating the metal, so it's gaining. Another question would be, what happens if you, um, oh, what happens if you do a precipitate? Oh, that was a good one. Maybe I should, uh, let me do, yes. I have a question. Shoot. Um, how do you know which elements or compounds to use in the salt bridge? If it gives you, like, a choice. Well, you need to use, um, usually you use a sulfate. So as far as your, your anion is usually like a sulfate, because sulfates are pretty soluble, not as, not as important. Um, you could also use nitrates, obviously. Sulfates or nitrates are fine. And then you need to use an alkali metal in your salt bridge, Na or K, um, something like that, that is always soluble. And so the reason I bring this up is let's say we have like on that last test, Pb2 plus plus cobalt gives us Pb plus, uh, oops, I didn't mean to make it so big. Uh, cobalt 2 plus, okay. And so what's happening is on this side, you have the Pb2 plus and it's going to Pb. So this one is the reduction, if you remember, right? This half reaction would be Pb2 plus plus two electrons gives you PB. So this is your reduction. Your oxidation would be your cobalt plus, uh, oh, I'm sorry, your cobalt goes to cobalt two plus plus two electrons. So this is happening at your anode and this is happening at your cathode. Now the reason that this is so important is what happens if you dump something in that's going to precipitate out the lead? So it's gonna make a solid out of lead. It's gonna take PB2 plus out of the situation. So the, um, we're gonna say precipitation, precip I'm spelling this wrong, that's okay. Precipitation at the cathode. And what will happen to the voltage, okay? And so what you have to look at is this overall equation and now you're gonna use Le Chatelier's, okay? If you precipitate out the PB2 plus, and so let's make this a different color. Let's say, make it red. This PB2 plus is going away, okay? And if you remember, if this is like the teeter-totter, right? And this goes up, so now, because I'm all about using other colors right now apparently, it's like this. Right? What will the reaction do to get back to equilibrium? Well, it's going to shift back towards the reactants, which means that if part of your part of your situation is you're trying to produce voltage, um, and the cathode is where uh, reduction you're having the plating, if that's going away and it's going back towards that side, that means it's slowing the reaction down, and so you have less voltage. Right? It's not producing as much um, because of that. 
If you had precipitated out the cobalt, it would then, the reaction would speed up. And so then you would have, um, you would end up getting more on the product side. And so that means that more voltage would happen if the cobalt ended up being precipitated out. And that's a tough one, I think, for students right now. But if you just go back to the Chateliers, go back to the Chateliers, when they start talking about precipitation of, a, of, of one of the cells, you have to go back and say, okay, which one's my cathode? Which one's my anode? Okay, is it is that mean that a product is being taken away? If a product's being taken away, then I know more voltage. If a reactant's being taken away, then I know less voltage. Okay, so you guys pretty good with that? Okay. It's nine o'clock, and so I don't want to go over on this on this too much. Um, I didn't get to electroplating, and so um, Maybe I could do that. Uh, I could do that in class, or maybe if we have another review session um, like next week. But Caitlin, you and I definitely need to talk about that because there'll be a couple of calculations questions with with that. So we'll do that. Are there any last questions you guys have for me? Um, I was doing a little bit of studying earlier, and I was wondering, do we need to know about the atom discovery history stuff? You know, that's a great question. That keeps popping up on um, like sample or sample stuff, but I have never seen, I take that back, they might have, but it's rare when they ask questions about the history of the atom and they ask you to, to figure it out. It's usually some theory, like um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that you, you can't do the location and the speed of electron. You can't get them both. You can get one or the other. But not like the dates and the people like having to know like what what was the purpose of the Millikan oil drop experiment or de Broglie's experiment you know you don't I don't I don't remember there being any connections like that and I didn't see that in any of this stuff which is it's not teaching critical thinking it's memorization so I'm gonna say no don't spend any time working on that because it doesn't fit with with College Board's current philosophy for their upcoming test. So at least there's no chance it'll show up on the free response. It might be like... Oh my gosh. Heavens no. It would not be on the free response. Okay. It might be a multiple choice question. I still think no. I still don't think it'll be there, but it's a good question. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. And again, I learned something new that I can share with my colleagues on Monday. So I really appreciate it. You guys will both be getting extra credit. And hopefully this was worth your while. Yes. Good. And um, so please feel free to email me. I'll be doing um, on Friday and Saturday. I'll probably be spending a little bit more time working on stuff. So I will definitely be available if anything comes up. But otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed the rest of your break. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. See you guys. Bye.